In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to continue on the sermon series today, Unstuck. I hope we can get unstuck and get ourselves to a place to where we're moving forward. And I want to talk to you today about unlearning, unlearning to get unstuck. So, Pastor, that kind of seems odd to unlearn. It does, but it is something that is, is a part of getting unstuck that is necessary in life. Listen here as Paul reminds the Corinthians how much that they mirror the children of Israel as they were coming out of Egypt. And he's letting them know that they're stuck and that they need to unlearn some things in life to get ahead. In 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 7, I don't want you to forget, dear brothers and sisters, about our ancestors in the wilderness long ago. All of them were guided by a cloud that moved ahead of them, and all of them walked through the sea on dry ground. In the cloud and in the sea, all of them were baptized as followers of Moses. All of them ate the same spiritual food, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. For they drank from the spiritual rock that traveled with them, and that rock was Christ. Yet God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. These things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of them did. Now later I'll go on through some more parts of that chapter to show you what they had to unlearn. But a lot of us find ourselves in a situation to where we're stuck. Maybe we're not getting what we need. Maybe it be, may be what we want in life. It could be that we're not growing or we're not moving at a pace spiritually that we want. Whatever it is, we feel stuck. We feel chained. We feel constricted where our spiritual life is concerned. You shouldn't allow the enemy to beat you up over that, to make you feel worthless, to make you feel like that you don't count the Christ or that your spiritual journey is not worthy. It is. It's just a fact of life. Sometimes we get in these situations and we need to know how to get unstuck. People get stuck in their car. They don't intend to, but they drive through a place and they didn't, was not, it didn't look visually like it was going to get their car stuck and they get stuck, but they need a way out. Our text today is a fresh reminder that there are things that we need to unlearn to get unstuck. And Paul uses the background of the children of Israel in the wilderness to teach us what is or is not pleasing to God so that we can progress in our spiritual life. Our instinctive reaction to our issues and problems in life is that new information or something that we don't know will get us what we want. In other words, we say, if I only knew the answer, then I would be fine in my life. You see, more times than not, we seem to believe that solving our problems in life is only a matter of adding a little more knowledge. You know, if I just knew this, or if I just knew that, or if I had the knowledge of this, it would make everything okay in my life. Considering how much information we have available to our fingertips through the internet, through Google, if you have an iPhone, through Siri, if more information was the answer to our problems, then we'd all be healthy, wealthy, and happy. Amen? Because there ain't a thing that you can't find out nowadays if you just go to the internet and Google it or whatever, you can usually get the answer in life. So is it a matter of just understanding more? You can try to learn more solutions or you can try to unlearn the problem itself. This is the thing in life. We don't, we don't entertain unlearning the problem. We seek for more knowledge in our life to see if it will get us ahead. In the last lines of Gandhi's autobiography, he wrote the following. I know that I still have before me a difficult path to traverse. And then he said, I must reduce myself 
to zero. I must reduce myself to zero. I want to ask you here today in the church, how close to zero are you willing to go with the self part of you? How willing or how close to zero are you willing to go? You see, how much do you dare to unlearn in order to go forward in life? When your parents said things to you like when you were growing up, I don't know if anybody, they said this to you or not, but mine did. Mine told me every once in a while I was getting too big for my britches. Did anybody ever tell you you was getting too big for your britches? Yeah, they told me that a lot. You know, or that, or that I better get off of my high horse in life. Or I'm going to take you down a notch or two. Did anybody's parents ever tell y'all anything like that? Amen. So y'all had parents similar to mine. They were in essence saying that you better get busy unlearning some things that is leading you down the wrong path. You, you better find out how to get to zero before I get you there. Amen. And so this was what Gandhi even was saying in his life statement. He had to get to zero in his life. Now listen to this, folks. It takes as much effort, if not more, to unlearn something as it does to learn something new. To unlearn it. To divest it out of your life. My dad, who has now been with Jesus seven earthly years, he really mellowed out later on in his life. He was, he was just an old country boy. That's all I can say about him in his days. He was never, to my knowledge, physically abusive to my mom, even though I did hear a few exciting dust-ups when I was growing up. You know, did any of y'all ever hear mom and daddy having a few loudly conversations in life? Eh, maybe so. One day, however, he observed a moment. This is when we were young, Denise and I, were first married. One day he observed a moment to where Denise would not comply with something that I wanted done. And he implied, metaphorically at a minimum, that a backhand slap would cure most of my problems with her. Mm. That's what he said now. You know, so he told me, I say he mellowed out in his last days, though. He's with Jesus now. Maybe Jesus backslapped him a few times. Amen. So, although I never followed that advice, because I am living and breathing here today, because if I had not have followed that advice, I know that I would not be breathing today, and I am married to a redhead, as you know. I had to unlearn, basically, in my younger days, coercive and manipulative tactics that were ingrained in my psyche in order that I might apply myself to loving my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And this is what I'm talking about by unlearning. There's things in your psyche and your mentality and your coming even in, in Christ in the church that's got you stuck because you're stuck on some things that need to get unlearned, that need to get deleted out of your life in order to get you out of the ditch in life. Many people never grow in their relationship with God or their family because they refuse to give up the following crutch. They say something like, this is just the way I am. You knew it when you married me or when you became my friend, so don't go trying to change me now. Now, I would not ask for a raise of hand, but I bet you there's a few of you here that said that to your mate or said that to one of your friends before. This is just the way I am. If you don't like it, take it or leave it. Bless God. Amen? This is a way that we try to present ourselves sometimes when we don't want to unlearn something that we should in our life. This kind of mindset that I just spoke of is an example of how people weaponize their rebellion against change or unlearning negative things while making demands that everyone else does the changing to make life easier for the person who is unwilling to change. That's just so common often. I don't want to change, so I just tell you this is the way I am. If you don't like it, you can leave it. So I weaponize my rebellion against that because I want you to change. I want God to change even. I don't want God 
telling me I can or cannot do this. I want to do as I want to do, and I wind up getting stuck in my life. This same scenario plays out in the lives of Christians who are stuck in spinning the wheels. To them, good change is everybody else changing to accommodate their unwillingness to do so themselves. I will ask you today, how much of a willingness do you have to change? How much of a willingness do you have to unlearn some things that have been nagging you, that have been staying with you, that have been keeping you stuck, and you know it? but you haven't been willing to change. You haven't been willing to put that aside or lay it down or to change your mentality or divest your mind of some negative thinking that was ingrained in you so that you can receive what God has for you to get you out of those slimy ditches in life. You see, I think so often about the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. Remember, he was gung-ho for God. He was so gung-ho that he, he believed that the law was the only way. He believed uh, the things of the Old Testament in such a way that he was going out and killing Christians who believed in Jesus Christ. He was raised up under Gamaliel, one of the top scholars of the Jewish sect in those days, and he had been ingrained that this is the way it was. And one day he was riding his horse, and you know the story, if you read it in the book of Acts, a great light shone down on him, and God took him down a notch or two. God knocked him off his high horse because he was getting too big for his britches, thinking that he could go out and kill who he wanted to in the name of God. Now imagine he is an intelligent man. He is brilliant. He is a scholar of scholars, Paul himself. But yet, when he comes to acknowledge Christ as Lord in his life, he goes into the Arabian desert and stays there for three years while God reschools him about what it means to be a Christian and live in the kind of life that ought to be. Paul had to go through an unlearning process in order to learn what God wanted him to know so that he could get unstuck and become an apostle to the Gentiles to bring them to know Jesus Christ. And if it was good enough for the apostle Paul to have to unlearn, to have to push that delete button over and over to where he could receive a new download from God to get out out of the mess that he was in, I encourage you here today to be open to God, to receive the word, to receive the attitude from the word of God that we might grow hereby. Amen? It is so important that we understand this thought today about unlearning things that we don't know. Maybe Gandhi actually got inspired by the Apostle Paul because he himself in Philippians 3 and 8 says that he had counted all things lost. He said, I've counted all things lost that I might know the goodness and the greatness of God. In other words, he said, I had to get to zero before I could start in my journey back to understanding God. And some of you here today would say, well, Pastor Jeff, I've been serving God 10. I've been serving God 15, 20, 30 years. Is not what I've learned good enough? Sometimes you have to take a strong look at life and say, why am I not growing? Why am I not progressing? Why am I not taking on this responsibility? And why am I not doing that? Sometimes, no matter how long you've been in the Lord, how long you've been a Christian, you have to step back and look and say, have I got some things that need to be unlearned so I can relearn in the right way? And if we're not willing to do that, if we're not willing, as Paul did, to say, I count all things but loss, that I may know Christ above all things. You see, it's obvious that if you and I cannot decrease in life, then God cannot increase in his power to us so that we can move forward. The scripture and the, John the Baptist said that. He must, he must increase, but I must what? Decrease. Decrease. Going to zero in our self, in our thoughts. And the children of Israel here, Paul is going to point out how that they continue to feed self and to feed the very situation of their own desires in life that kept them stuck in the wilderness. And Paul said to the Corinthians, you're just like them. He says, you've adopted the same attitudes that they've adopted. And just as they were stuck, you're stuck. And you need to be free 
in life. So we must decrease. And if we're not willing to unlearn some things, then we're going to be limited in our spiritual growth because of idols, both mentally and physically, that we refuse to displace in order to make room for the things that produce healthy growth. Do you understand that if you're not willing to get rid of that which is unhealthy, there will be no room for that which is healthy? And sometimes you've got to deny yourself. That's what the scripture says, that when you take up your cross, you deny yourself and follow after him. You put out the things of the world so that there's more room for God in your very life. The legendary tennis coach and author Tim Galway had an interesting, had an interesting formula for performance, which is performance equals potential minus interference. Performance equals potential minus interference. Now you say, what's this got to do with unlearning? How many of you realize that after you're saved, that God expects good works or performance? Amen? Y'all didn't realize that. No, nobody acknowledged their head. And so you don't get into the kingdom of God through works, but after you're saved, he expects good. Ephesians 2 and 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So here he tells us in Ephesians 2 and 10 that we've been created for good works. In Matthew 5 and 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So here we say, that God has created us for good works. He's created us to do things. He's created us to bring glory to the kingdom of God. He's created us to get out of the quagmire and the stuck places that we're in so that we can let the light of Christ shine in our life. The question then arises, what are the interferences? If that, if that formula there was, per, was performance equals per, potential minus interference, what are some of those interferences that impede our progress in Christ from getting unstuck? What is interference? Let's look at the definition of what is interference. Interference is any obstacle produced in the realm of the soul or the flesh that gets in God's way of transforming us into Christ's image. You are supposed to be transformed into Christ's image. And there are interferences that hinder your potential spiritually in God so that you can perform and do the good works that God called you to do to magnify the name of Jesus Christ. In Romans 12 and 2, he says this, Don't copy the behavior and custom of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So the key in there is let God. Somebody say let God. Amen. Let God do what? Change the way you think. Let him give you the ability to unlearn so that you can relearn some things that need to be done. So what are some of those interferences in general that infringe on God's transformative power of changing us into Christ? I think one of the greatest ones that I've seen in life is a little word, no, it's a big word actually, a big word called procrastination. Anybody here a good procrastinator? I mean, I, do we have any pros in here? Hey man, any, uh, we, we got a few amateurs, but do we have some pro procrastinators? Sure, procrastination. What is procrastination? It is the unwillingness to commit to things that cause us discomfort. You look out over, I got a honeydew list in my back pocket here. I, I keep it with me all the time to where I can know what I need to do and what I've got coming. But you know, when I look at those things, usually the ones that are going to cause me the most discomfort are the ones that just keep getting passed over. Amen? The ones I like to do or that, that gives me pleasure to do, I'm going to do that. And so oftentimes, when you procrastinate, you simply have an unwillingness to commit to things that cause you discomfort. 
If you want to grow in God, if you want to work in the house of the Lord, if you want to grow in ministry and reach out and touch other people, you're going to have to do that with a mindset that Christ must increase and your flesh must decrease. And that just is a change that a lot of Christians are not willing to make nowadays. They just simply say, well, no, if i got to do that, I'll, I'll just go to church on Sundays and I'll just come, that's all I'll do. Because they don't want to change. They procrastinate in life. You know, Peter, he tried to get Jesus to put the cross off. He said, no, 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 you don't, you don't need to do that. That, that, that. That's not for you. And then in Matthew 16 and 22, but Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such a thing. Jesus had just told him he's going to be crucified and go to the cross. He said, heaven forbid, Lord. Then he said, this will never happen to you. This is, this is uncomfortable. This, this is painful. We're not going that route. And then in verse 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. You see, when we look at the obstacle instead of the one who has the power to give us that, we are looking at the hindrance we are looking at the pain that's involved more than we are the willingness to let it be a part of our lives that we may grow in God Almighty. Seeing things from a human point of view, not God's. Years ago, a very famous preacher surveyed the Bible to find out what were the most important words in the Scripture. For instance, he wanted to find out what was the saddest word in the Bible or what was the happiest word in the Bible. He looked for the word that had even the greatest emotion attached to it. And there was a whole list of these words in that book that he wrote. But when he came to the most dangerous word in the Bible, the word that he chose was tomorrow. Tomorrow is the most dangerous word he found in the Bible. You're going to do that tomorrow, right? What God's been speaking about you to take hold of and do, you're going to do it tomorrow, right? Sure. That change that you were making in life that was going to get you closer to God and get you more into a mindset with God, you're always going to do it when? Why don't nobody want to say that? You're always going to do it when? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. It's a dangerous word. It's, it's procrastinating. And I'm going to tell you that we are living in a time that we don't have the time to entertain the word tomorrow. If we don't do what we got to do today with all that's within us, it's not going to get done because tomorrow will come maybe and then it will just be tomorrow again. If you're going to grow and draw close to God and get unstuck out of the ravines and the ruts that you're in, say today is the day the Lord has made. I I will rejoice and be glad in this day and I'm going to quit spinning my wheels today and I'm going to grab traction in the Lord and I'm going to move forward not tomorrow but today amen somebody say amen you know I'm preaching to you the truth amen glory to God this is a little difficult for us to hear sometimes but I never thought about tomorrow being the most dangerous word in the Bible but it is Satan will come to you and tell you, you don't need to worry, you know, just put it off to tomorrow. You, you know, Jesus ain't going to come, just put it off to tomorrow. You know, you're, you, this is never going to happen to you, just put it off to tomorrow. And people put it off and put it off and put it off until it can be too late. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 4, he who observes the wind and waits for all conditions to be favorable will not sow. And he who regards the clouds will not reap. I mean, I'm getting ready to plant my garden, I think, sometime soon. Miss Lillian back there, she's, she's kind of wanting me to nudge me along to plant some of those things, and we're probably going to do that. But, you know, if I wait and look and say, oh, no, it's going to be raining Wednesday. I can't do this, and I can't. I'll never get seed in the ground, never get plants in the ground. You've got to move forward in spite of what your conditions are sometime, right? Did not the scripture say to be instant when? In season and when? Out of season. 
You're, you're, you're to be ready. You're to be available. You're to, you're, you're to be in go mode all the time. How many of you are glad that our troops are in, in season, out of season? The, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, uh, the Marines and all, they're ready to go now, not tomorrow. I would hate to know that, well, they'll be ready tomorrow. Well, what if something happens today? We need people ready today. You say, amen. I'm going to have to pull Rick back in here so some of y'all don't get excited now. He's outside doing security today, but I can bring him in. Praise the Lord. In fact, when he was gone on vacation, he says, Pastor Jeff, he texts me. He says, Pastor Jeff, he said, um, uh, if you would, he's sitting there. He comes walking in the back door now. He said, he said you can put your cell phone on the front, and he said, just dial it in to me where I'm here, and as you're preaching, you'll hear me go, Amen! So I, I don't know, yeah, hey man, he's back there now, praise God, you folks in trouble. Listen, David, you remember when, when David came on the battlefield for 40 days, the Israelites listened to an overgrown giant blaspheme their God and send railing accusations against their heritage and against their armies. Nobody would do a thing. Nobody would move, scared to death, fearful. I understand what a giant, that, that was an awesome thing to look at. But here come a little boy off the shepherd, a shepherd boy off of the, the, the fields tending sheep. And he sees this giant. He says, what's everybody waiting for? I just heard him blaspheme God. I just heard him come against our God. He said, let me fight him. Not tomorrow, but today. Today, he said, as he looked at that giant. He said, I'll take your head off today. I will kill you before all the armies of Israel. Not tomorrow, but today. And what did he do? He stirred up his brothers. And all the people that were there were angry and upset that he had such an attitude that he wasn't unstuck. Why? Because he learned how to praise God in the shepherd fields. He learned how to kill a bear and how to kill a lion. He had learned how to look after the sheep. And he was not going to stay stuck just because everybody else was afraid to move forward. He says, I am going to move for God. I'm not going to procrastinate in my life. Secondly, from procrastination comes distractions. Distractions are something that hinders us from unlearning the things that we need to learn in life. What is a distraction? It is an obstacle to attention. It is a mental turmoil that we get into, a distraction in our very lives. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 30 through 32, those who weep, or rejoice, or who buy things, should not be absorbed by their weeping, or their joy, or their possessions. Now hear the word distractions in this. Those who use the things of this world should not become attached to them. For this world as we know it will soon pass away. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. You see, this is what God wants us in life, to be free as we can be from distractions. You'll always have them. But, he, but there are some of those distractions that you need to unlearn. There are some of those distractions that you could delete, if you would, that are keeping you from a growing relationship in God Almighty. Distractions. We'll always have people pulling at us. We'll always have people demanding our attention. We'll always have this or that. But listen to me. We've got to, we've got to get out of that cycle of allowing these things to hinder our prayer, to hinder our reading, to hinder our service unto the Lord. Always being distracted. Thirdly, there comes limitations. Limitations in life. How many of you know you've got limitations? Oh, some of you know that. Rick Warren said this. He says, we live in a culture that constantly tells us you can do it all. Oh, you can do it all. You can have it all. You can be whatever you want. But it's not true. You can, you, you can be all that God wants you to be. But you cannot be whatever you want to be. I want you to hear that again. 
what Rick said. He says, you can be all that God wants you to be, but you cannot be whatever you want to be in life. There are limits in your life. And until Christians today come to understand these limits, we are not going to unlearn the things we need to and get unstuck. The psalmist had it right in Psalm 119, 96, in the first part of this. He says, I have seen that everything human has its limits and end, no matter how extensive, noble, and excellent. Everything that has to do with your human structure, your human makeup, your human surrounding, it's got limits. We're not God. We're, we, we are not divinity. We have limits in our life. You've got physical limits in your life. Some of you don't act like it. But we do. We have physical limits. You cannot go without food or water, but for so long, just try it. Just try it. And you know what will happen. You'll die because you cannot go without it, but for so long. You have emotional limits. You cannot bear up under everyone's problems and not take care of yourself and remain healthy emotionally in your life. You cannot because you have emotional limits. You have time limits. Every day contains only 24 hours, and part of that time is reserved for sleep. How many of you, like me, wish you didn't have to sleep? It just, you know, there's times I go, I say, why do I have to go to bed? Why do I have to do this? This is, I'm going to waste eight hours. But I got limits, and the reason I'm not wasting those eight hours is because I got limits in life. Amen? So you have time limits. You know, I sure wish, and maybe you do too, that there was an app, we all app crazy nowadays, that would go off when it detected that you had reached your limit. Bonk, 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 bonk. You have reached your limits. It is time for you to go on vacation. Bonk, bonk, bonk. You've reached your limits. It's time to divest and unlearn some things. You need to put it off. Bonk, bonk, bonk. And really, you don't need an app because you already got something that God built into you that does it. It's called pain. It's called fatigue. It's called stress. It's called irritability. When those things start going off, when you, it's called losing your joy. When you lose your joy and you become irritable and you got pain and you got fatigue, it's because you haven't been respecting the limits that are in your life. I pray for us to get unstuck and to unlearn things that we will leave this place today saying, God, I'm going to lay down this conquest to try to be what I want to be. And I want to be what you want me to be. Because he has an anointing and a power for you to become what God wants you to be. Some of you say, well, I, I don't know if I can make it financially in life if I, if I let God let me be what he wanted me to be. What is it? You think God's broke? What is it? You think God don't have the solution for you? You think that God don't, that, that if he's got a plan for your life to give yourself into some different area of your life that you're in right now, that he won't take care of you? My God, where are you coming from? I'm telling you what, if you tithe and honor God with the first fruits of all that he gives you, a, a principle laid down in the entire word of God, I'm telling you something, he will obligate himself to you like you've never seen to make sure that a way is made in life for you. You need to unlearn some of these things that we're, that, that we're you thinking you can make it. It depends upon what you do, and it depends upon your creativity. It depends upon your conquest for knowledge and solutions. No, it, can, it depends upon God to fill our souls from the crown of our heads to the soles of our feet so that we can have the wisdom and the knowledge of God. That's what will get us unstuck above all things. What keeps most people spiritually stuck where limits are concerned is that we finally realize we must do something to reduce our load. Now, I want you to hear this real good. When we finally reach that place of where we understand that we need to unlearn or to quit doing some things that's been stressing out our limits, this is where most people make mistakes. When they realize that and they start reducing their load, most people cut back on God instead of the world. 
People get so loaded up and doing things, and they'll say, well, I am so overloaded, so I guess I'm going to have to quit going to church. I guess I'm going to have to quit doing this for the kingdom. I'm going to have to lay this down. Don't you understand the deceptiveness behind that? That you're going, instead of laying the world aside, you're going to lay God aside? When God, if God so blesses you that you no longer have time for him, if God so blesses you that there's no longer space for God to be inserted into your life, then you're not blessed. You may think you are, but you're not. And you're stuck in a quagmire of where God wants you to come out in life. Brad and Christy, if y'all will come. And then I move on to confrontation. One of, one of the things that keeps us from becoming what God wants us to become is that we avoid confrontation at all costs. Avoid confrontation at all costs. Some of us have learned in life that the way to have peace is avoidance of any conflict at all costs. If I was just asked for a general opinion of that, how many of y'all love conflict? Man, really? Not a single person raises their hand. We don't, I mean, I don't go asking the Lord every morning, Lord, I just need a little more controversy in my life today. I'm kind of bored. Can you stir things up a little bit for me and give me some excitement, some controversy? Lord, I just, I need some more. I think most of us are asking the opposite for God to reduce level more or give us less of that. So some of us have learned in life the way to have peace is avoidance of any conflict at all costs. I have come to tell you that the things you have learned may very possibly be hindering your growth and victory in life. They must be confronted correctly or they will not go away. I feel like I need to say that again. I've come to tell you that the things you've learned that are hindering your growth and victory in life must be confronted correctly or they will not go away. You must unlearn passive conduct that leads to defeat and learn how to engage in appropriate aggression that leads to victory. God didn't call you just to be passive, to be a doormat, to let people wipe their feet on you, let the devil wipe his feet on you in life. There is an appropriate aggression. Some of you might say, well, pastor, I don't believe in aggression. Well, what are you going to do with the scripture that says the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force? What are you going to do with Paul's command to us that says fight the good fight of faith? Lay hold on eternal life. I've come to tell you it's time to do what James 4 and 7 says. It says, so humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Listen, church, the word resist in this passage means to set oneself against, to oppose or rebel. This is spiritual aggression. Some of, why am I saying this? Because some of you are going to have to quit being passive about why you're not growing, about why you're not flourishing in spiritual growth, in the work of the kingdom. It's because we sometimes let the devil push over us and we fail to discern what is happening. We fail to discern how he's keeping us from God, how he's keeping us from the Word, how he's keeping us from fellowship in the body of Christ. And God is trying to raise up a people who will unlearn those things and relearn what it means to fight the good fight of faith. To say, I need to get aggressive with the enemy if I will resist him stand up against him oppose him come out against him as never before the scripture said he must flee from me it's not even a debate he must flee from me and yet some of us continue just to be passive in our life last scripture here 1 Corinthians 5 4 through 6 from the Passion Translation so call a meeting and when you gather together in the name of our Lord Jesus and you know my spirit is present with you in the infinite power of our Lord Jesus, release this man over to Satan for the destruction of his rebellious flesh in hope that his spirit may be rescued and restored in the day of the Lord. Verse 6, boasting over your tolerance of sin is inappropriate. 
Don't you understand that even a small compromise with sin permeates the entire fellowship just as a little leaven permeates a batch of dough? He's confronting the issues of aggression and passiveness here. And he's saying there comes a time that you have to be aggressive for the things of God. And he said, you guys in Corinth, they were being very passive about a man who was having sexual relationships with his stepmother in the congregation, and they weren't doing anything about it. In fact, they were boasting about it. And God was saying, this is not something to be passive about. You must get aggressive in this situation and turn this one over to Satan so that his flesh can be destroyed, if that's what it takes, so that his spirit can be saved in the latter day. And I don't know what it's going to take in our lives, but you've got to get aggressive against the devil on how he's destroying. The Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his mission in life. He's going to destroy your spiritual aspirations. He's going to try to destroy the anointing. He's going to try to destroy you from growing spiritually. And yet, many of us are just passive about it. We think it's just ordinary things of the day. And God is saying, open your eyes. Let me anoint your eyes that you can see how the devil is stopping you from being what God wants us to be in the kingdom of God and how we're supposed to do it. And if we're not willing to unlearn some things, some of you need to go back and have some serious conversations in your family and with your children, with your husband, with your wife, and say, look, I've not been, I've really not been making myself available to God. I've, I've kind of just been living because this is the way I thought I always was and should be. I've always just kind of thought, like I said, this is the way I am. If you don't like it, take it or leave it. We ought to be saying, I'm not like Christ. I need to be more like Christ. I, I've got more to say here, but I don't have time to finish. I wanted to go in and show you the parallel, how God contrasted what the Egyptians or the children of Israel did on their way out of Egypt in this journey. Maybe I'll pick it up next week. But I'm going to tell you, folks, it's time to get unstuck. How many of you believe time is short? How many of you believe that we are nearing the end as never before? Can you see the signs? You see, I don't really believe that we believe it. I believe that we just say it because we just kind of acknowledge, oh, yeah, I see some signs out there. It's really troubling. Because really, what you really believe will motivate you. If you really believe there's a fire in the house, you'll head for the exit. If you really believe something, your actions will prove it. And so I say to ourselves in a church and to all that are listening live here today, truly what you believe is what you will do. If you believe there's things in your life that need to be unlearned, deleted, and put aside, that you need to go to zero so God can increase in your life, then you're going to begin to experience spiritual growth like you've never seen in your life. But if you just get passive and leave this service and say, well, the pastor don't really know what he's talking about, you know, then I'm, I'm just not, I'm not going to do this. That, that's not my way of doing it. Listen, you better, you better ask God. You better talk to God about it and find out what you need to get aggressive over so that you can grow above all things. Or else, tomorrow will just become your favorite word. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll get involved in church tomorrow. I'll get involved in this ministry tomorrow. Tomorrow. And one day, tomorrow's never going to come. Hallelujah. Unlearn. Praise God. Hallelujah. Would you bow your heads across the building? I believe that God knows and hears your heart. I've been so surprised and shocked by this sermon series because when I did it, God just gave me a rough, simple outline of, of a lot of different topics to do. So on some of my sermon series that he gives me, I have a whole lot more spiritual insight of where I'm going or, or what God wants me to do. But every week, God does a download in my spirit through this thing. It's, it's just amazing the things that I begin to dive into. And I believe the reason for that is that, that he's an on-time God getting ready to deal with some present problems in our lives. And I believe in this congregation here today that there is spiritual growth that is being 
retarded, that's in regression because we're not seeing the spiritual light that God wants us to see. We're not seeing what God can do, His power, His ability, His strength. We've learned some things over life that have captivated us and captured us and has kept us stuck. And until we're willing to become vulnerable enough to lay those aside, and start becoming what God wants us to be instead of you determining what you want to be, then that growth, that life, that power will never be full, filled to the fullest potential that it could be in the Lord Jesus Christ. 